think of the Victorians and Edwardians, and images like these come to mind. Starched aprons, all very prim and proper. Meanwhile, at the other end of society, authors like Charles Dickens and Wilkie Collins conjure up images of orphaned children in workhouses, women confined to terrifying mental asylums. It's no wonder we might assume the Victorians and Edwardians had little time for children with mental health issues. But the reality of the time may have been somewhat different. Uh, so I was looking at children who were taken into care. So the first thing that struck me, when you think about the late 1800s and children who go into homes, we tend to think it's orphans or whatever, but actually it's children who grew up in, in families that were not functioning because of alcoholism, um, mental health issues and parents. And I found that those children who were taken into care, the, the approach towards them was more caring than I expected. I mean, I expected uh, children to be treated a certain way, you know, the harsh Victorian times as we see it. But actually there was a lot of sort of focus on what can we do to help this child? Uh, especially those children, for example, who have mental health issues. The phrase mental health was first used in the late 1800s and the research revealed some major differences in the way people with mental health problems were described back then. The big difference I found was the language. So uh, the language that was used was uh, they are lunatics, uh, imbecile, um, in mental health condition was sometimes described in terms of learning difficulties and at other times in terms of uh, being a bit peculiar. Intelligence, ability to work, morality and how serious the mental health issues were became huge factors in decisions about the children's lives. There was a bit of a sense that if it's minor issues and if the child was reasonably well behaved, you know, it's a nice chap sort of thing, then yeah, they were able to help. And, and if the child could work to an extent that had a reasonable amount of intelligence, whatever that means, then that was fine. Yeah, as soon as there was a sense that uh, especially intelligence was low, which they seemed to make quite firm judgments, because for example, in some of the correspondence, there were letters from the children. Uh, one girl who ended up in an asylum uh, because she was found uh, wandering the streets, uh, she was described as difficult and having attacks of, of mental issues. Uh, but she wrote a letter and she said, I, I would really like to leave and I would really like to see my family again because spring is starting and I've got so much life left in me. And they decided against it. But we still do that. We still have, you know, children that we make decisions about and they may well want something else. And it doesn't always happen because we feel that one thing works better than another. Even today, children that are in care or leaving care confront mental health issues. The researchers say that we can learn from the Victorian and Edwardians approach. We still have a lot of issues around uh, catering for children with mental health issues. And it seems like we can learn from, from the approach, the caring approach in the Victorian and Edwardian times. But also, I guess, to an extent, we can learn from their mistakes and in how they use the language. But still, we don't have, we haven't given the child a voice. And we are looking at it. At the moment, there's a lot of talk around children who haven't got a voice, we need to listen to children. But, but we still don't do that. We talk about children, we make decisions about children. So next time you're reading Dickens, remember he might not be telling the whole story of how children were looked after at the time. Charlotte Buredney, that's Solent.